Court v. Dena Edwards & Associates. Good morning, Your Honors. Steve Blunt on behalf of Dwight Brock, Clerk of the Cuyahoga County Circuit Court. At the outset, I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Sure. Your Honors, there are several issues raised in this appeal, but I'd like to kind of cut to the chase and address them in a reverse order, address what I believe is the most important one first. As Your Honors are aware, this is an appeal of a final declaratory judgment determining the appropriate fee to be charged by the Clerk of Courts for providing copies of records, public records, under Chapter 119 and 2824 of Florida Statutes. And once the trial court made what we believe to be the proper determination that 2824 did apply to this circumstance, it became a question of interpreting the subsections of 2824, and specifically subsections 5 and 7 with regard, 5, 7, and 28, with regard to whether or not the public records being requested were instruments or documents or things reduced to writing, as the case law would say instruments means, or information contained in a computer database. Let me ask you a question first. Does Chapter 119 not apply to your client? With regard to the access to non-judicial records and or judicial records, for that matter, 119 would apply with regard to access, and 119 does determine access, but 119.074 provides specifically that that's the aspect with regard to the charges, and it says that the charges in 119.074 only apply if there is not another fee prescribed by law. The trial court in this case properly determined that Section 2824 is that other fee prescribed by law, which applies to the enumerated services to be provided by the clerk of courts, including preparing the appellate record on appeal, recording documents, providing certifications of plats, and copying any instrument in the public record. But there's also a very little-known provision that there's almost no case law about, or actually no case law about, subsection 28, that says that when the clerk provides copies of information contained in a computer database, it reverts back to 119 and says then the charges will be as set forth in 119. So really the meat of this matter is, are email written correspondence that were requested to be scanned and copied by the appellee, are those documents or instruments as set forth in subsections 5 and 7, or is that information contained in a computer database, as the appellee would argue? The appellee takes that argument one step further and would argue that instruments or documents cease being instruments or documents when a computer comes into play. So they say if the clerk stores it on a computer, then it's information contained in a computer database. If the clerk copies it through the use of a computer and stores it during that process, it ceases being an instrument and becomes information contained in a computer database. And if they produce the copy electronically on a disk, well then now it's information contained on a computer database, and in any effect, chapter 28 or the subsection 28 applies. If the court accepts that interpretation, as the trial court did with regard to these emails, then you've eviscerated 2824, because 2824 has numerous functions that are now done electronically and done within the computer. For instance, public records, instruments in the public record that are recorded in the official records, don't cease being instruments once they're put in the computer. They didn't cease being an instrument with the advent of e-filing or e-recording. In fact, as I argued in my brief... None of these are instruments recorded in an official record, right? These are, this is an internal auditing manual and email. None of those are recorded. That's true, Your Honor, but under the Wilkins, under the Wilkins decision, which interpreted 2824 subprints 5 and 7, which talked about instruments, the Wilkins court said that instruments are documents, not just official records. Instruments are anything reduced to writing. Well, they can be documents, but, but isn't, aren't we getting, as I view chapter 28 generally and specifically 2824, I think of the, the items listed there are things that are specific to the clerk of circuit court duties. You know, recording things, taking documents that have been produced by third parties and holding them for safekeeping and for public notice purposes and so forth. 
I mean, that's a general description. I mean, there is specified duty. And if you look at the, the first sentence of the statute, the clerk of circuit court shall charge for services rendered manually or electronically by the clerk's office in recording documents and interest instruments and in performing other specified duties. And I, I think of that as duties specific to the clerk. Whereas chapter 119 applies to government agencies generally, and certainly the clerk is one of those as well. And can a distinction be made between, you know, uh, something that is that the clerk has taken and safeguarded or recorded because that's a specific legal duty of the clerk versus sending emails or produced an internal auditing manual that is really just a matter of his own internal business practice. Well, I, I would. Is that different from what any other agency might do? I would. I would suggest, Your Honor, that the other specified duties is referring to the specified duties listed in paragraphs 1 through 28 of 2824. It lists the specified duties. But if you were going to make that distinction. No, I don't think so. And performing others. Uh, and, and, shall and if you charge were, for services rendered manually or electronically by the clerk's office in recording, in recording documents and instruments and in performing other specified duties. I would submit that Specified duties refers to duties of the clerk. The charge for services, that's the list of services. And among those services are specifically listed, copying any instrument in the public record, not any instrument in the official record, not any instrument in the court record. So, yeah, any, so you say any public record? Any instrument in the public record, yes. Any public record. Well, it wouldn't, well, what, what would sub be, well, 5 would what, what of these would not have qualified? What at issue today would not have qualified under that definition? It's the clerk's contention that nothing at issue would, wouldn't qualify right, under so that you mean definition. Any nothing at record. issue in this case. Any public record. But for instance, a sound recording instrument. would not be, a, a copy of a sound recording would not be uh, uh, an instrument in the public record as that instrument is, as that term instrument has been defined by controlling case law. Wilkins says that that term instrument, as used in that statute, is not limited is, to is, what's recorded. Is, is, I is fully agree with that. It's an expansive definition. It means anything reduced to writing. It's the clerk's contention that an email. Without limitation. Without limitation. Without limitation as to the copy uh, service uh, provided. A post-it note. You know, saying, let's have this meeting at 10 o'clock. I don't care what the county commission says. That's, that's, you can get charge a dollar. If that's a, if that's a public record that's been preserved by the clerk for safekeeping and that's a document that is responsive. Like but I would areas. also, but I would also point out, Your Honor, that the area of inquiry for this public records request were duties specific to the clerk. That yeah, is the clerk's sure. audit function. The request was. No, 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 no. The audit function is a duty. The creation of an internal manual to assist the clerk in his own business practices. There's no law that says he has to do that. Actually, I think it is required, although it hasn't been an issue in this appeal. I think it is required under the state's audit. It's a requirement of the audit of the clerk that they maintain that manual as part of their duties as audited uh, annually uh, uh, by, by the, the outside auditors. Code, it's, it, so it is a law, requirement. But not by law. It's a part of the administrative code. But why would, how does the clerk differ from any other agency in either of these respects? Because the legislature has mandated that the clerk charges these charges set forth in 2824 for these specified why, duties why and, and with all due respect the would do that i'm sorry your honor why would the legislature do that because why the clerk the legislature say these things that these things that about the clerk that are no different from what any other agency any generic agency might create the clerk gets to charge you know ex multiples more than I, any other government agency. What I, would the reasoning for that be? I, I would suggest that what the clerk does and the clerk's spe specific role in the dual function of the clerk and the clerk's role as county recorder and the keeper of county documents, including county financial documents, puts them in a unique role. And I think that's... So I, any but public record the clerk might have, they get to charge under Chapter 28 instead of 119. Well, it depends. If, for instance, under recent uh, amendments to the rules of judicial administration, court records are placed online and anyone can see them online and they can print a copy at home. Under that 
Uh, yeah, but, but we, under that, know, we already know that the, the, the rule of judicial administration exists because this stuff does not govern the judicial branch under case law. Well, under Wilkins, this governs this, the charging scheme in 2824 does not violate the principles of Aki or the separation of the no, dual roles no. of the clerk. That and, the, and, and in fact, if you go to, uh, within the case law, one of the, uh, um, one of the opinions, I believe it's uh, Wilkins cites the statute relative to the Supreme Court clerk charges and references the fact that instruments includes paper and other instruments. As it, as it talks about the term, it talks about paper and other instruments. So what we're no, talking no, about no, is the clerks no, in this unique role. Under the rule of judicial administration, for instance, if there was a document, say, filed in a court file, that's not recorded, it's filed in a court file. Correct. Certainly that would be a, a document or instrument subject to, to the clerk's rule. But a letter the clerk wrote to, uh, I don't know, an air conditioning repair company because the air conditioning was out, would that, that would be a public record, correct? Correct. Would that qualify as an instrument, say under this statute? What if your client had sent that? Yes, letter? under under the so under the controlling your case law of Wilkins. Letter complaining that the air conditioner, air conditioning company's work was not very good or whatever. That you get to charge a dollar for that. Yes, your honor. There's no provision in in. 2024 or in the controlling case law of Wilkin that says that there's any distinction in those public records. It, it, Wilkin says that an instrument is anything reduced to writing. It's, it's that it's that expansive. And so if the I Wilkin think it case. Can be. I think it certainly can be. And so if the Wilkins case is controlling and, and the clerk's position is the Wilkins case is controlling. Well, it's controlling in the absence controlling below, perhaps, but not here. In the in, in the absence of of some uh, other case law, and I think I cited the court to Miller versus State for the proposition that uh, the the opinion of a, of a sister district court is controlling, absent no, some not other controlling, it's not other controlling on district courts. It might be controlling on circuit courts. It is it is controlling authority, and clearly, this court's within its discretion to to adopt a different view of of the case, but not right. of Wilkin. Wilkin sets forth, is, is the only case law out there that sets forth uh, the definition of instrument as used in 2824. Right. Um, and it, it would be within this court's, court's purview to adopt some contradictory uh, uh, definition, but that may create so a con conflict that we can go up with. Right. right. Okay. Um, but if you look at. The, go up to where the author of the Wilkins case is now. And, and, and by the way, Your Honor, um, the, the argument that that specified duties language uh, only refers to certain specified duties of the clerk is not an argument that I've, that's been raised today, that's been raised Yeah, in, but you recognize the, that you want us to write on this, and we can't write it. We can't write without doing damage to the law strictly limited to what was argued below or not, because the problem is, is what if we disagree with, the, with that theory? We don't want to mess the law. Right. So, what would you have us do then? Not right? No, Your Honor. I think I think under 2824, I would point point the court to the language in 2824 uh, that says that those services that are enumerated, and I think those specified duties is is referring to the specified duties set forth below, and that uh, it says that the clerk must charge those fees uh, on those specified duties. Um, whether those services are provided manually or electronically. And that was the issue that was before the trial court, and that was the issue that was argued, was whether or not through the process of scanning and copying and duplicating these emails, did they become or were they information in a computer database rather than instruments or documents. And well, you seem to have, you know, and on that point, you seem to have two, two sort of odd scenarios. You have you have uh, a book that is in physical form, and they could have they could have said we want copies of this, and that would be in the, like a Xerox, right? Or they want it electronically, but it doesn't already exist electronically, so you, you scan it, which is functionally the same thing as Xeroxing, only it outputs to a digital file instead of on paper. Okay, so I could see your argument that that is a that is copying a paper, and they argue no, that's digital. On the other hand, you got emails that are already in digital form, 
and they want a digital version, but you print those out and then scan them. And now you want to say those are now paper. So you two are arguing two different. No, no, Your Honor, I don't think that's our argument. I don't think paper or non-paper makes any difference here. I don't think how it's stored makes any difference here. But I would point out that the only testimony at the trial was that the emails in document form did not exist in the clerk's computer database, that that's not the way they were stored, that emails are stored in bits and bytes encoded information, uh, and that they're stored in a database with thousands of other emails, and that they're not stored in that PDF uh, document form. Okay, So I don't think that they were stored in that manner in the first place. But I don't think that's dispositive. I think what's dispositive is, what is the requester asking for? Is the requester asking, asking for instruments or documents, or is the requester asking for information contained in a computer database? And if you look at the Siegel decision, which was cited, cited by the appellee, it deals with a circumstance where the requester was asking, uh, it was the Broward County School Board, was asking, uh, uh, the requester was asking for the data from the computer, the information contained in the computer database, and they were offering to provide appropriate programs to access that data. And specifically, the Siegel Court made some distinctions between what is information in a database and what is an instrument. The Siegel Court said that there can be no doubt that the information stored in the computer is as much a public record as a written page in a book or a tabulation in a file stored in a filing cabinet. And that means the bits and bytes, the coded information is public record that the public has a right to access. Uh, all of the information in the computer, not merely that which a particular program accesses, should be available for examination and copying in keeping with the public policy underlying the right to know statutes. The information in a computer is analogous to information recorded in code. So you're saying it's, that because so you're saying these emails, since they were not in that form? No, I'm saying they're not asking for that encrypted code is not what was asked for. What the, what the appellee asked for in this case was scanned copies of written correspondence. She didn't know if they were going to be in emails or in letters or in post-it notes. And those post-it notes would be a public record that would be maintained by the clerk. And she didn't know that, that that's the way they were going to be stored, and she has no way of knowing that. Uh, without accessing the public record first. But when you look at the, the history of 2824 and the subparens 28 that was added back in 1994 relating to information contained in a computer database, the only legislative history we can find on it is that the legislature said this service is now being provided and there's no mechanism to tell the clerk what to charge. And that's why we're adding this. So you're saying that that does not, that term does not refer to like an email. It refers to raw bits of data. Yes, Your Honor. It refers to the, in, the, yes, the information. But an instrument, Otherwise, an instrument can be any piece of paper with writing on it, but that, that, that term stored in a computer database is a very limited term. Yes, Your Honor, because it refers okay. to the coded information held in the computer, which It doesn't can say be, that. Which, well, but as the Siegel Court noted, when they talked about information contained in a computer database prior to the passage of subsection 28, um, what the Siegel Court noted is that that data can have a lot of value to of it. Of course, of Because course. it can be it's manipulated. Public. There's no question about it. So, the, for instance, the clerk would get requests for pictometry data that's held, uh, aerial photography. Right, GIS um, stuff. Right. Etc. cetera, GIS things, exactly, Your Honor. And that's what that information contained in a computer database was supposed to be uh, addressing. And in 2013, that became very clear because in 2013, remember, the legislature added the term to all these services rendered manually or electronically. They didn't make a distinction if you were making, if you were pressing the print button or the save button. If you're, if you're giving them a copy of an instrument in the public record, the fee is a dollar per page by photographic process and six dollars per page by non-photographic process. I've helped you use up all your rebuttal time, so you probably ought to sit down and I'll give you like four more minutes. All right, Your Honor. Um, so, but in, in conclusion, Your Honor, the key to this is whether or not these emails are instruments or documents or information contained in a computer database at the end of the day. Uh, the trial court, despite the fact that these are writings, that they're produced in document form, that uh, the appellee asked for them to be produced in scanned copy form. 
uh, found that they were information contained in a computer database, despite the fact there was no evidence uh, uh, to that effect whatsoever in the record. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Merritt Hanna. I'll be arguing for the appellees. My co-counsel, Giovanni Mesa. I have to say that I feel somewhat like Alice in Wonderland. I went down a rabbit hole. I don't know exactly how I got there. Not wholly unhappy to be there. Partially happy with the trial court's order, but um, pretty I'm confused. <laughs> pretty confused with with the way that I got there. Um, I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal before I go further. Contrary to the Brock's, the clerk's contention, the clerk's statute doesn't apply here. Wilkin does not apply to this case. And it's clear from the opinion when you read it, the word court is sprinkled throughout the opinion. The clerk in his functions as a court body, as an arm of the judiciary. This is a body that is an agency under the law and as such has a duty to the public to keep and hold documents. And the Constitution of Florida says specifically that the clerk wears two hats. One, as the clerk of the court, an arm, a function of the court, and the other as a, um, a clerk for the Board of County Commissioners. I hate saying ex officio because I get caught up on that. But Really, that duty is a ministerial duty and could be under law, general or special, passed for an entirely different person to handle that. And if that was the case, we wouldn't be here today. It would clearly fall under 119. We'd be addressing the charges at 15 cents a page, and there would be no issue in front of this court. So I think that's a big key for the court to look at, that that we should stay focused on the Board of County Commissioners. We shouldn't get involved or bogged down in legislative history when we don't need to. It's plain, it's clear on its face, it's 119, it's a public record, it's 15 cents. When you- well, the, the distinction between the clerk, the clerk's court duties, judicial branch duties, and other duties doesn't really encompass the clerk duties as the official recorder for the county. I mean, official records, those are not, those may or may not be judicial documents, but they're not part of judicial, the judicial function. Correct, they're not part the of chapter 20, the chapter 28 take, covers all of them, correct? Correct, but it does refer you to 119. It does. So how do we differentiate between what, what is a chapter 28 public record function and a chapter 119 public? function I think is the issue. Well I think again you have to look at the genesis of the the issue. Where does this begin? With the Board of County Commissioners and it's an agency. I think it's pretty clear that as an agency it's subject to 119 and therefore you have to switch over to that statute and address the the charges under that statute. I, I don't think I, I failed to see the court's logic when I first read the opinion. I wanted to think it was a good opinion. I wanted to believe what the court said. We However, always do. <laughs> as I went further on, I couldn't couldn't so rationalize. You're, what you're suggesting is that this is really a public records request directed to the county commission. Correct. And, and if the those clerk is the one who is the keeper of the county commission documents. Exactly. If if those records, which they could under the law be placed in a separate, a separate place. They could be housed in a different body. However, for purposes of convenience and because the clerk set up to do that, to handle that situation, they just so happen to be within the clerk's confines. And the Wilkin decision, which expansively defined instruments, is just inapplicable to this situation. And there's no need to follow that rationale under this situation. It, it's not an instrument, although it is, I would say, a legal document to the extent that it was created for some purpose to guide people. It's a public document. It's a public document. It's an internal business. But it's not, it's not your typical legal document. It's not a description of property. It's not a, a mortgage. It's simply 
public records that are created by a county agency. So to, to put this, to foist this unnecessary moniker onto these records just adds an additional cost that doesn't need to be there. And I would also submit that it would make it impossible for the clerk's office to have to determine every time, go through the analysis, is this a public record or is this a, uh, where, where are we? I think it's pretty clear when it's Board of County Commissioners, it's a public record. When it's clerks functioning as a role of judiciary, then it falls within the clerk statute and the higher fees apply. But, but keeping it simple for everyone involved, including the, the judicial stuff is that's actually dictated in the rules of judicial administration. Administration 2.051. Right. right. So, the, so chapter 28 has to do with official records like the OR books and other stuff that gets filed with the county, right? Right. I, I think what what tends to direct everybody into the, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again because I believe it so firmly, is that the clerk has a broad function. The clerk does a lot of things. The clerk wears many hats. And in this situation, it just so happens that the clerk is the administrator of these documents by happenstance, perhaps, or by the Constitution, which could be happenstance. The clerk gets to control what is given. And what I'd also like to point out, and I think it's important for the court to, uh, to take note, is that the clerk's policy now, which was posted on February 16th, is, seems to be, to me, in um, accordance with everything that we've submitted in our cross appeal. And that is that the clerk, the body of the, the Board of County Commissioners, the clerk is ex officio, clerk of the Board of County Commissioners, I said it, is, a, um, is subject to 119. And if you look at that policy, I think that'll be pretty telling in, in um, your review to um, reach the conclusion in this case. What I'd also like to point out is that this whole discussion of information, the raw data that's, that's put forth, frankly, it's, it's beyond me. And I don't think that a clerk or somebody who's making these decisions every day should have to go through and figure out, well, is this email actually raw data? Do we have to actually go through this analysis before we present and how we figure out how we're going to compile these charges? I think that it's pretty clear the legislature meant that an email is an email. I think that it's pretty clear for, in practice, for everyone to go along their daily business and, and formulate a plan based on what you rationally understand something to mean as opposed to being forced to resort to legislative history or analysis and figure out what raw data is, what metadata is, what information is contained in a computer database, outside of the fact that we push control save, we save a document on our computer, can we burn it to a disk? If we can, it's easy, there's no paper involved. But if we can't, then the additional charges would kick in. The, the, the sticking point, and Your Honor had addressed this issue, was the scanned document. And you had mentioned functional equivalent to a copy. Yes, it is. However, that's not what the court found in this case, and that's not what was presented below. What happened was that the clerk took it upon itself to create these extra documents. And Ms. Edwards had no control over that. So to now say that she requested something and by virtue of her request that went unclarified, she's required to pay an additional fee would be onerous and I'm sure the legislature never intended that. Unfortunately, I have no case law to direct you to that point. Well, I mean, she did say, you know, I request a scanned copy of. However, it seems to me that what was going on here, somebody could have picked up the phone. Exactly, and the statute does require that if you're confused, you seek clarification, and that wasn't done. Right, because, you know, until, you know, and she says markups are written, cor written correspondence. Okay, so maybe the clerk could have said, well, you requested written correspondence, and these are emails stored on a computer, and that doesn't, you don't get those under this request. But clearly the clerk knew what she wanted. The end result, the CD. Right. Now, what's also curious about that is that the clerk could have called her and said, look, you know, we made these copies. Do you really want us to go through the trouble of scanning it? You know, can we just give you the copies? That wasn't done either. All we have is a well, bill. she would have said no, not at a dollar a page. 
Exactly. I would have. I couldn't afford that. Right. All we have is a bill for $556. It's a dollar per page. And there's no special service charge in that, which I would understand. The clerk went through a lot to get these documents. To isolate these, to find these emails and isolate them. And right. I'm not diminishing that that effort on the part of the clerk. But that, none, of, none of that was done. No. And, and it seemed, as you read the record, which is a bit tortured, that the the policy morphed. There was a gradual metamorphosis of the policy. It wasn't consistent. And I think, perhaps, as a result of this case. That policy is now set in stone and will be clear for everybody involved. But when Ms. Edwards brought that to the attention of Mr. St. Cyr, complaining that, no, I believe this should be 15 cents a page, not a dollar a page, that's when the communications broke down. And what's also clear from these emails and, and the, the dialogue that developed was that they, they were both telling each other what they wanted. It wasn't someone who just walked up and said, I want this. They didn't give it to me. I'm going to the court. This was an exchange that occurred over time. They were trying to develop what was happening, making each other happy. Maybe it wasn't the ultimate result. Parties were unhappy. But it wasn't, it, it just ended up exploding into something that didn't have to happen. Had there been a written policy, something that was solid in place for all the employees to understand and give Ms. Edwards a firm, no, it's 15 cents a page. This is what it is. Thank you, goodbye. But unfortunately, that didn't happen, and here we are today. Should the court decide to affirm the lower court's order, we take no issue with the charges for, fit for the emails, obviously. If you want records and you don't have to pay for them, that's great. Pay for the CD, acknowledged. However, the fact that Ms. Edwards would be required to pay $556 for a manual that doesn't cost that much to create in and of itself is outrageous. And the statutes don't allow for a windfall. The law does not allow for the clerk to have a windfall. And I submit to you that that would create a windfall to the clerk, absent some evidence of what it actually costs the clerk to get to that point. If they would have taken a clerk's salary and no, but again, they weren't, they didn't, that didn't include right. service charge. That was just calculated on a, a dollar per page. On the face, a dollar per page. And I'd ask this court to reverse, reverse the lower court order and to require the lower court to stick with 119, to stick with the policy, to stick with something, something that everyone can understand, that everyone who seeks public records and wants access to public records will be easy and able to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, very briefly, um, there was a reference to a policy that was uh, posted on the clerk's website in February of 2015, well after this matter. It's not part of the record, and it, in any event, referred to access to public records and not charges. Um, uh, the other, uh, the implication that, that someone could have picked up the phone or that there was no communication on the part of the clerk's office is, is abjectly false on the record. This was a series of public records requests that began in mid-January and went through to the record requests at issue here, the ones that were made on February 7th. There were a series of in-person meetings. There were inspections of the records. There were opportunities for uh, the appellee to copy them herself, to take photographs of them. She did take copies of some of them. Um, there was an offer at the end on February 7th for an additional meeting to address all of the concerns. The record is replete with efforts by the clerk to communicate and distinguish exactly what, what was being looked for and the cheapest way to provide it. Um, and the record was also replete with, through those, those requests, well, the, the appellee being very the specific. Way, I would think the cheapest way to provide the emails would not be printing them out and then scanning them. Well, the, the testimony by Crystal Kinzel was that she went through her outlook to identify the emails. And as she pulled them up on her screen and, I, and identified whether or not they needed to be redacted, she believed that the easiest way for her to now produce those was to simply print them. I would suggest that hitting the print button versus hitting the save button was the same effort. I don't think it mattered. Yeah, what but, but the difference is a 
dollar. You're, you, you're saying she would have charged a dollar a page no matter what. Well, but yes, Your Honor, I am. Because I think you're producing an, uh, you're producing an electronic copy, and, and 2824 in 2013 says very specifically that the, the charge is the same whether provided manually or electronically. It's the charge for the service regardless of how it's produced. And this emphasis on paper, I think, is just simply misplaced. The dollar a page is not, a sheet of paper does not cost a dollar, but that's not a windfall to the clerk. The legislature passed 2824 and said a it dollar is, because it, it requires some effort. It is a windfall to the clerk, but the clerk makes money that way, and that the legislature funds accordingly. I understand how it works. So the, 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 back to my argument, the, the, uh, the trial court did not rule that the 15 cent a page uh, uh, 119 provision applied. They, they ruled that 2824 applied, and that was consistent with the arguments presented at trial. And in fact, that argument of 15 cents a page was not something new that came up from the appellee at the, at the final stages. That argument was uh, made from the very first time the appellee came in to look at any public records. It was her contention from that first moment that it was 15 cents a page. This argument that subsection 28 applied, the argument that the trial court grabbed onto, was an issue that was never even pled. That was an issue that was brought up in memorandums after the fact, after she already had the documents, after the clerk had already stipulated to provide the documents. Uh, and so it was an issue that was never raised to the clerk prior. Uh, if that issue had been raised to the, to, to the clerk prior, presumably the clerk would have assessed that legal argument at that time prior to giving the documents, but that didn't happen. Uh, so if there was any... Uh, well, wait, 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 let us come back. The 2824 was what the clerk was standing on to begin with, correct? Correct, but not sub-28, which was the information contained in a computer database language. The appellee made that argument that the emails were information contained in a computer database for the very first time in their memorandum uh, after the initial documents were provided, after a preliminary hearing and the documents were provided. Uh, that argument is not in their pleadings, was never pled, uh, was sort of a, a, a document that, that was born, or, or an argument that was born after the fact, after the documents had been produced. So that was not the nature, in other words, before the documents were produced, nobody was claiming that she was looking for information contained in a computer database. It was after the lawyers got involved and after there was an initial hearing and after the documents were produced that somebody said, aha, there's this obscure subsection 28 of 2824 that says for information contained in a computer database, we go back to 119. And that's how that argument was developed over time. That was not the argument initially. Um, but if 2824 applies, the plain language of 2824 requires that all instruments, which again, have been defined as anything reduced to writing, are at a dollar a page uh, for copies made by photographic process. And by non-photographic process, it would be more. Uh, so to imply that the, the trial court made the argument that somehow non-photographic process was less cumbersome. If that's what the legislature had intended, then non-photographic process wouldn't be more expensive than photographic process. Subsections five and seven set forth the copy charges for instruments by photographic or non-photographic process, and non-photographic process is more expensive. Uh, so that rationale simply doesn't apply. We'd ask the court uh, to reverse the trial court's ruling with regard to the emails, uh, that they are instruments or documents reduced to writing, uh, and that they're subject to the charges of 2824 sub five. Thank, Thank you, you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Another interesting case. Boy. I simply have Oh, you still have a rebuttal, few, I'm sorry. A few points, sorry. I know you want to go. Never mind, I, I, no, I, go I, ahead. I understand. I, I simply want to say that my client is a journalist, and the clerk is aware of this fact when she came in. She had requested an interview with the clerk regarding these home audits. Now, what's, what's particularly important about that is that under the statute, motivations are irrelevant, but the clerk was aware of, of what she was doing, and actually she put forth several interview questions within one of these emails. So this, this record isn't something that, um, I, I forget exactly how opposing counsel uh, characterized it, but, but it's not something that the clerk was ambushed and had no idea what was going on. Right, and, right. And but you know, I understand that. And, and obviously there was, some, there was some back and forth about you know, some suggestion that somehow the clerk was angry at the, at the website and so forth and so on. But, Really, this all comes down, to, I think, to a matter of statutory interpretation. 
whatever And the statutes are plain on their face. Were. Right? I'm sorry? I, I would submit the statutes are plain, and there's no need to get into all of this, this right. other stuff and, and mess with everybody's head. Let's just let's keep it simple and... Plain act. Exactly. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank We'd you ask much. that you uh, reverse the lower court's ruling and remand. Thank you. Good job. Next case.